Hi, my name is Dr. Jake Herndon. I am a math tutor from Chicago. In this video, I'm going to do a little bit of real analysis. So if you are studying the Riemann integral and you would like to see a few examples, this video might be interesting to you. Uh, before I get into the integration, I want to let you know that I tutor online. My website is herndonmathservices.com. You can contact me through my site. All right, on to the Riemann integral. So this whole page is just going to be definitions. If you already know the definition of the Riemann integral, you can probably just skip ahead. But if not, you can read along with me. A partition P of a closed interval from A to B is a finite sequence of real numbers so that the, the zeroth term of the sequence is the left endpoint of the interval, and the last term of the sequence is the right endpoint of the interval. and uh, all of the numbers in the sequence are in increasing order. An interval of the form x sub k minus 1 comma x sub k is called a subinterval of the partition. So just in case this is confusing, subintervals of partitions are not subsets of partitions. Uh, the partition only has finitely many points. It's this finite sequence. But the subinterval is the entire interval between two adjacent terms of the partition. OK, now suppose f is a bounded function on a closed interval from a to b, and let p be a partition of that interval. For each subinterval of the partition, let little m sub k be the infimum of the function on that interval and let big M sub k be the supremum of the function on that interval. So uh, because f is bounded, both the infimum and the supremum will exist. The lower sum of f with respect to p is this quantity. It's L of f comma p. It's equal to the sum from k equals 1 to n of little m sub k times x sub k minus x sub k minus 1. And the upper sum of f with respect to that partition is u of f comma p. And it's the same thing except for using big M instead of little m. So you want to think about the lower sum as being an under approximation for the integral, and the upper sum is an over approximation for the integral. So now let this fancy p be the collection of all partitions of the closed interval from a to b. The lower integral of f is L of f, and it's the supremum of all the lower sums over all partitions. And the upper integral of f is u of f, and it's the infimum of all the upper sums. So L of f is what we get when we try to make the, the lower estimates as big as possible, and U of f is what we get when we try to make the overestimates as small as possible. And we say f is Riemann integrable if the lower integral and the upper integral are equal. And if that's the case, then whatever that real number is, we use this symbol to denote it. So the integral from a to b of f is the lower integral, which is also the upper integral. And for the rest of the, the video, I'm going to stop saying Riemann integrable, and I'll just say integrable. So I, I should let you know, in case you don't know, there are other kinds of integration, uh, but they're not going to come up in this video. So it's safe to just say integrable. All right, uh, so one of the main questions that you study in like a first semester real analysis class is what sorts of functions are integrable? So here's a fact you usually prove in that class. If you've got a function on a closed interval from A to B that's continuous, then that function is integrable. Uh, however, the converse is not true. There are integrable functions that are not continuous, and so I'll give an example of one of those now. So let f be the function defined on the closed interval from 0 to 1 by f of x is equal to 0 if x is not equal to 1 half, and f of x is equal to 1 if x equals 1 half. 
All right, so I want to graph this function here. So the graph looks something like this. It's zero everywhere, except at one half there's a jump. It's clear that f is not continuous because it only takes the two values, zero and one. There's a jump discontinuity at one half. So I want to show that it is integrable. And I want to do this using the definition because uh, the definition is long and takes some practice and uh, takes some getting used to. So claim one the lower integral of f is equal to zero. Proof goes like this. You take any partition p of the closed interval from zero to one and any subinterval of p, there is some point in the subinterval where f takes the value zero on that point. So in red, I'm marking endpoints of my subinterval. In any subinterval, even if it contains the point one half, there are going to be some points where the function takes the value zero. So the infimum on every subinterval is zero. So then if we compute the, the lower sum with respect to that partition, all of these little m's are zero, and so the whole sum is zero. So uh, that also implies that the lower integral is zero. Claim two, the upper sum of f is equal to zero. So this one's a little bit more interesting. For any partition p of the closed interval from zero to one, the, the upper sum is greater than or equal to zero because the function is greater than or equal to zero uh, on the whole interval. This implies that the upper integral is greater than or equal to zero because the upper integral is the infimum over all of the upper sums. So what I'm using there is the fact that if you take an infimum, you preserve weak inequalities. So because here we've got greater than or equal to, here we've got greater than or equal to. All right, now let epsilon be a real number strictly between 0 and 1. Uh, this ensures that uh, these four numbers show up in this order. So 0 is less than 1 minus epsilon over 2, which is less than 1 plus epsilon over 2, which is less than 1. So this is a four-point partition of the interval. So let's call the four point partition p sub epsilon. So p sub epsilon looks like this. Uh, here is one point in the partition, zero. Here's another point, one. And then the other two points are this point, which is one minus epsilon over two, and this point, which is one plus epsilon over two. So I've drawn the partition in red. It's these four points. And then we've got these three sub intervals. The only subinterval where the function is non-zero is the middle subinterval, and there the supremum is equal to one. So if we put that all together, the the upper sum is these three terms. The only one that matters is the middle term, and the middle term is this. If you cancel everything here, you're just left with epsilon. So that says for any epsilon in the open interval from 0 to 1, there is a partition p sub epsilon with the upper sum with respect to that partition equal to epsilon. So we have that the upper integral is greater than or equal to 0 from before, and the upper integral is less than or equal to epsilon for arbitrarily small epsilon. And this implies that the upper integral is equal to 0. So that's the end of claim two. So combining claim one and claim two, now we get that the lower and the upper integral are equal and they're equal to zero. So the function's integrable and the integral is equal to zero. So barely fit on the page, uh, but there you go. That's, that's an example of a function that's not continuous but is integrable. So next I wanna give an example of a function which is not integrable. 
Let f be the function defined on the closed interval from 0 to 1 by f of x is 0 if x is not a rational number and f of x is 1 if x is a rational number. And you can't really graph this function, but I am going to pretend that I can. So like I said, you can't really graph this, but if you could, the graph would look something like this. So now, if you've got a partition of the closed interval, so I'm drawing a partition in red, on each subinterval of the partition, there's rational and irrational numbers. So the infimum of the function is always 0, and the supremum of the function is always 1. From that, it follows that the lower sum is equal to 0, as the little m's are always equal to 0, and the upper sum, uh, it's the sum from k equals 1 to n of this difference, and when you expand this difference, everything cancels except for the 0 and the 1. So you get 1. So the, the lower sums are 0 and the upper sums are 1 for any partition. So that means the lower integral is 0 and the upper integral is 1. And because the lower and the upper integral do not agree, f cannot be integrable. So to close out the video, I want to give a couple of exercises. Uh, so exercise 1, suppose you've got a function on the interval from 0 to 1, which is 0 except at finitely many points. Show that f is integrable and the value of the integral is 0. So I'll draw what this looks like. Here's exercise 1. Here's the interval from 0 to 1. Uh, there's finitely many points where the function is not 0. So maybe it looks like this. And everywhere else, the function is 0. So I don't know, something like that. This function is 0 except for uh, at 3 points it's positive and at 1 point it's negative. So functions that look like that are Riemann integrable. And exercise 2. Suppose f is the function on the closed interval from 0 to 1, which is defined by f of x is equal to 0 if x is not equal to 1 over n for any natural number n, and f of x is equal to 1 if x is equal to 1 over n for some natural number n. So I'll draw that graph here. Uh, so this function looks like this. You take the sequence 1 over 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. The sequence converges to 0. And you define the function to be 0 everywhere except for on the sequence. So here at 1, at 1 half, and at 1 third, and at 1 fourth. But everywhere else, it's 0. I'll just leave it as a question. Is this function Riemann integrable? And that is the end of the video. Uh, so let me just say one more time that I tutor online. So if you are looking for a real analysis tutor, you can get in touch with me at my website, herndonmathservices.com. All right, bye.